Uh, hey, everybody, for people coming in, uh, if you if you, you can scan the QR code here or visit the link below to get to the repo, uh, please use Gitpod or Code Spaces for the uh, for the easiest way to get started. If you have either of those uh, either of those enabled, um, you can. It is possible to clone the repo as like a template and install everything manually, but that that probably will take a, a little bit um, to find everything. So please use either Gitpod or Code Spaces, and those should work actually out of the box. Everything should be working when you set that up. Uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand, or if you're having any issues, raise your hand, and we'll uh, we'll walk over and try to help. All right, so it's time to start. Uh, welcome to our talk. Uh, or to a workshop, uh, must I say. Uh, implementing a WASM native database API. My name is Laurent Dauguin, I work for Couchbase, and I'm today with... Victor, my name is Victor Adasi, and I work with Cosmonic. We build WASM Cloud, which uh, runs WebAssembly. Right, so uh, you've already seen that slide. That is the let's get started slide. Um, the whole point of this is to get to our repo. On the readme, there's a link to Gitpod. Gitpod is an online IDE. And so if you click on open Gitpod and you create your account, you'll have an online version of VS Code that's going to download all the stuff for you in the cloud so we don't have to do this over this Wi-Fi, which would be a terrible idea. Um, so it should work smoothly. It should give you a nice online idea with everything you need to, you know, to get started building stuff with Wasm Cloud and Couchbase. Uh, and so about Couchbase, uh, that was too fast. Uh, <laughs> uh, agenda. Uh, what did I say? A word, yeah, a couple so words. First, first, we're going to talk a little bit, um, Laurent, about the Couchbase side and me more about the WebAssembly and, and Wasm Cloud side. Uh, again, Wasm Cloud, the open source project. Uh, and then we're going to get to writing some code. But we want to set up some of the context just so you know a little bit about what's happening and where the sort of ecosystems are and um, what this sort of uh, workshop represents. All right, so I'll start with Couchbase. Uh, this is a, uh, what is Couchbase? Uh, have you heard of bad Couchbase before? Could you please raise your hand if you have? Some of you. I'm assuming most of you are here for the Wasm part. Um, Couchbase uh, uh, name comes from a couple names, uh, CouchDB and Membase. Um, Couchbase is the merge or a fork, depending on who you ask, of CouchDB and Membase, which gives us Couchbase. Distributed key value in memory with persistence. Um, and the way you would do query at the time was by writing MapReduce function in JavaScript, creating index, and then querying those index, which of course nobody wants to do. So we added SQL, and we added a whole bunch of different things. So what you see on, the, on this slide is our architecture. Uh, we have a couple services. You have the data services, which is basically the auto-sharding, key-value distributed stuff. You get SQL, you get full text. You get AI stuff, you get you, you know, all the new thing that, that is going to turn into a, a Couchbase cell talk, so I'm going to stop there. But if you want to talk about Couchbase more, um, I'll be at the Cosmonic booth all day. Um, basically, this is Couchbase. We have, did I jump a slide? Yes, I did jump a slide. This is how we store things in Couchbase. That's important for you for the workshop to know. We have, um, we own a SQL database. We store JSON documents. Uh, so it's not a relational database. There is no table and primary key. It's just collections on which you would store JSON. And we allow you to run SQL queries on JSON documents. So our goal will be to connect to a bucket, scope and collection, and to start you know, writing and reading documents from that collection using WebAssembly. Uh, this is going too fast. Yeah. There we go. Actually, I don't know how to use a clicker. That's the issue. Um, different, different clients, uh, different capacity, different capability, as you folks would say uh, at uh, Wasm Cloud. Uh, you can do key value. You can do SQL. You can do full text. You can do a whole bunch of different things in a whole bunch of different language. Does it matter anymore? Like we maintain a native version for every single one of those SDKs. Uh, is there a better solution? Probably. Uh, Couchbase started 15 years ago. At the time, uh, I think Wasm didn't exist. I think it was called AssemblyJS, uh, ASMJS in the browser. Um, maybe if we were to redo everything all over again, we could you know, just write once and then use all the Wasm binding everywhere. 
uh, which is uh, what Victor is going to talk about uh, now. I yeah, think. thanks, thanks, Laura. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to explain just a just a quick level set on what WebAssembly is, and Laura touched on it a little bit, but um, the technology has been around for a while and originally started as a way to run other languages other than JavaScript in the browser, right? So obviously people who dislike JavaScript were big fans, and uh, we're still big fans, and we like JavaScript as well. But the, the basic idea is to take your language, whichever language you have, compile it. And you can think of the Java case, right? When you compile Java, what you get? You get a jar, right? You get some bytecode. When you compile Python, what do you get? You get bytecode, right? WebAssembly is a bytecode that comes from other languages, from multiple languages, and can run anywhere, right? So you can think of it like a binary format. If you open a WebAssembly binary, like the file that gets put on disk, you're just going to see gibberish. You're going to see binary. Uh, but it has a lot of other functionalities and a lot of other features that sort of make it powerful. And so we start from almost nothing, which is just really basic binary operations. You can think of like assembly. Um, and we build up. So we build up to file access, we build up to internet access, etc. So basically, it's a compilation target. You can think of it as a binary file, right? You can think of it like, you know, code that would have, you know, been run on x86, let's say, a machine or Apple Silicon. Um, but it runs on a, on a runtime that embeds everywhere. So the basic runtime or the, the sort of flagship runtime is developed by the Bytecode Alliance. Uh, which we also contribute to, uh, and it's called Wasm Time. So our open source project, Wasm Cloud, sort of wraps Wasm Time and makes it a bit easier to use, but you can think of Wasm Time uh, as the Python interpreter, if we're talking about Python, right? Python is to Wasm as uh, Python, the Python interpreter, Python, you can think of it kind of like a compiler, is to Wasm Time. Uh, and like I uh, mentioned a little earlier, there's extreme isolation here. So WebAssembly, the core spec, only has numerical operations in it, right? Can't do anything, right? There's, there's, no, there's no like concept of a string even, right? So you have to build all that back up on top of a very isolated and of course very secure uh, by default uh, base. And we want to really support building, again, across every language, right? Whereas the JVM, you would generally build, let's say, Java, Scala, Clojure, if you're into that, Kotlin, into a, a jar. Um, we want to take every language and compile that into a WebAssembly binary that runs on, let's say, like Wasm Time or, or, or wherever, wherever you'd like to run WebAssembly. And this, this includes in languages, right? You'd probably never try and embed the JRE into your... JavaScript app or into your Ruby app, but you can embed Wasm Time in your JavaScript app or your Ruby app. And you can get functionality that's like, let's say you want some functionality that's written in Rust or written in Zig or written in some other high performance language, C, C++, and you wanted to use it from your language, you can do that. Uh, so this is a little bit of what I've, what I've said earlier. Um, this is written a little bit in terms of support for languages, sort of top left is languages with sort of the best support, or let's say uh, a lot of the tooling is written in. Uh, and so we've got, you know, Rust, Go, we've got newer languages, Zig, C, C++. The idea is that all of these ecosystems are adopting WebAssembly at the same time, right now, right? And so this means that upstream code is being patched or being added to, to modify Go. So in, in our case, that it's both big Go, we call it, and tiny Go. So tiny Go is a sort of subset of Go. Um, that has really good WebAssembly support. And uh, a bunch of that is getting merged up into Big Go as well. There's JavaScript and TypeScript because they're kind of similar, let's say. They have shared tool chain. Um, and you've got Python, you know, all these other languages. But the idea is that you don't necessarily change your code. You use the compiler you normally use, but what you get out is different. You get out where you wouldn't necessarily get out a binary before in like an interpreted language. You get out a binary. You get out a WebAssembly binary. So one thing I didn't cover that was on that earlier slide for, for those readers in here is the strongly typed interfaces, right? Um, if you start with WebAssembly core, you get nothing, right? So you get just basically numerical operations. You have to build in types on top of that. Um, the types, the way we build in those types is uh, with the WebAssembly interface types standard and specification. So if you're doing something like building a database, what you want to do is you want to change your, the calls you would normally make 
in process, and remember, WebAssembly is in process. We do distributed things with, with Wasm Cloud, but that, that doesn't change WebAssembly at its core, is that most of the time you're running in the same process. Function call speed, not network speed. So you'd wanna change what you would normally call like you know, an SDK call, right? You wanna change your insert call into, essentially replicate it in an interface that describes the arguments, describes the types that are required to make that call. So we've done that uh, with the help of Laurent here and the help of uh, a bunch of other Couchbase contributors. We've essentially broken Couchbase down and the SDK into many of the other, um, many of the sort of distinct functionalities it has. So there's like document management, there's some key value stuff. There's um, a little bit of search queries, right? There's, there's full text search, there's vector search. That stuff was really new and actually very exciting. Um, but we've, we basically, you, you, know, you do this once, right? This is like almost like gRPC, right? You sit there, you look at the interface, you decide what kind of interface you want, and you encode it, right? Um, feel free to scan that QR code because that is a link to the repo that has all this on there, and you can, just, you can actually just go look through the wit. So you can look through the full specification of Couchbase as we see it, right? And the thing is, you can actually write another one if you'd like, right? If you want a different set of features, if you want a different set of... Uh, exposed types, you can actually completely change this if you'd like. But we have that out, and that's actually out in our um, operator repo. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I just wanna wait. Is everyone scanned it? Anyone still need scan? Okay, All right, I see one person. I'm gonna just take a second. All right, okay. So if you can build interfaces, like let's, if you sort of go back to the beginning, if you have core WebAssembly, uh, and that means you can you know, do th things with numbers and you build upon that to, had, to add rich types, right? So you can, now you can do things with strings, you can write functions, you can, write, you can specify interfaces. Um, you can have multiple things adhere to the same interface. So one of the things that's being built along with WebAssembly is the WASI, and which is the uh, WebAssembly standard interface. Standard of system kind of changes, but generally WASI is how we refer to it. And WASI key value is actually one of the standardized interfaces because we, uh, and this is also sort of shepherded by the Bycode Alliance and many of the other sort of companies involved in WebAssembly. It's a, it's a growing standard. We recognize that key value is an important interface, right? Lots of people use Redis. Lots of people use caches. Lots of people use things that are sort of key value related. So if you have a thing or any sort of program, let's say a database that supports key value, you can expose it with a key value interface. And more, moreover, you can use the same key value interface to talk to possibly different implementations. So that's important here. Now we won't actually use this in the, um, in the workshop because the workshop will be focused on documents, but Couchbase supports obviously key value documents and a lot more. Um, so this is actually, there's actually also an implementation um, in this repo. So that link is actually to the line of code um, that is being shown on the slide. And there is a, there's a section of that repo that has a key value implementation for Couchbase. These can actually be the same, right? We have them separate, but you can actually have the same, you have multiple interfaces sort of exported or made available by the same piece of um, the sort of WebAssembly uh, native, let's say binary. So uh, we wanna get you started with the, the, uh, the workshop, we, we, don't, we don't have a, a ton of time, but we do, we do wanna get you started uh, quickly. So if you, uh, for those who haven't seen this before, you can scan it uh, or go to the, uh, the GitHub repo below. And we recommend that you use Gitpod or GitHub code spaces to set up the environment really quickly. Uh, and there's, a, there's a link to Gitpod on the readme. So yes. once you're on the, on the GitHub repo, if you scroll down a little bit, there's gonna be a badge that says open Gitpod. And so that's probably the easiest way to, to, to do this. It's gonna open VS Code online in, in a tab in your browser. And it's gonna download the Docker image that has Cashbase, that has uh, uh, Wasm Cloud, that has uh, Wash, which is a uh, web yes, Wasm Cloud, the Wasm shell. Cloud shell. Yes. Uh, and a bunch of other things like TinyGo um, that we're gonna need for this workshop. So, so we really encourage you to use Gitpod because it, it will set up everything automatically. All the downloads are gonna happen somewhere in the cloud in one of the Gitpod machine, not on that Wi-Fi, which is better for everyone. Uh, so if anyone has any problem with this, please raise your hand. Uh, and then if not, we'll uh, uh, start playing around with it as well. Okay. 
Uh, and just to explain a little bit about the repo, um, what we've got here is we've got a repo that has a Wasm Cloud provider in it, or, or sorry, I should say, a Wasm Cloud component that talks to a Wasm Cloud provider. So uh, a few slides ago, we showed the link to the Wasm Cloud Couchbase provider. Uh, and since we do need something to actually store state, right, we do need something to actually manage the data, we use that provider, which gives us access to, to Couchbase. But the part you're writing will be a Go app called NewBase, right? So there should be a NewBase folder in there. Uh, so there should be a NewBase folder in there. And um, that has got a bunch of Go code uh, that you can run against and uh, sort of look at and inspect. Um, but you should also be able to, if you set up in Gitpod or if you set up in the code spaces, you should be able to curl it. You should actually be able to just use curl and hit this sort of API right away. Yeah. So here's the repo. I'm looking at it. There we go. Yeah. So generally, you should, if you click this, you know, get pod button, you'll get uh, an opportunity to make the workspace and sort of like open the project. And you should actually start, and everything should be running. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, sorry. If you don't have a get pod account, you might want to make an account. If you prefer GitHub code spaces, that's also fine. Uh, they should both work equally. If you prefer to do manual setup, the instructions also include manual setup for everyone who wants to you know, install things themselves. Uh, again, if you have uh, any questions or you get stuck anywhere, please just raise your hand. Uh, we'll get someone to run over and, and talk to you. What it's doing right now, it's, it's pulling my Docker image that I made specifically for this workshop that has all the dependencies you need, uh, so cache base, Wash, TinyGo, Wit, with some tools. Uh, there's the um, uh, VS Code Couchbase extension as well. There's going to be the uh, Couchbase shell tool that allow you to you know, use Couchbase with the command line, which is which is nice. Um, of course, Git and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, and as Laurent mentioned, mentioned earlier, um, to build WebAssembly components, we produce a tool called Wash, the WebAssembly shell. Oh, sorry, the Wasm Cloud shell. Um, but the, the point of that tool is to make it easy to build uh, Web WebAssembly binaries in different languages. So you can download Wash. Again, you won't have to because the, the Gitpod container will have it. Um, but you can download Wash and just Wash build um, any components like, and also create new components in, lang in different languages. So this, we have also a bunch of templates which can make it easier to get started. Now you won't have to do any of that because we have a Wasm Cloud project um, called NewBase at the end in the repository already. Uh, and again, this will just be in your, in your Gitpod setup, but just to, just to note about, uh, about some of the tooling here. So yeah, we'll follow along, along here with uh, with Laurent as he as he does it. Oh, it's it's installing Just. Do you want to talk about Just? Oh yeah. I feel like you love to talk about Just. <laughs> well, uh, for people who are somewhat familiar with uh, with Make, right, or sort of like the build tool, Just is a is a task runner. Now the the sort of most important tool here is Wash, but we use uh, Just here just to sort of make it really consistent and kind of like a, a sort of top level porcelain for, for, all the, for all the commands you want to run. But what you can do at the top level here is run just dev and it'll run um, our tool wash, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, it'll call wash dev. Uh, you, can, you can look down, yeah, so he's, he's scrolled to it there, but you know, it's very simple, right? So we're gonna CD to the new base directory or we're, gonna, we're just gonna run wash, right? We're gonna run wash dev. Uh, wash dev is a, uh, self-reloading, uh, so essentially a develop, developer or a development environment to easily and quickly iterate on when you're building when you're building components. So you run Wash Dev. We actually set up, for example, an HTTP server. We set up the and build the component, and we make sure that we reload any of those things when the code changes. Now, there's a lot of stuff that sort of happens behind the scenes, but in general, what you get is a whole bunch of log messages, and you should be able to curl. Uh, the uh, curl localhost, right, and access your component, and access in particular this component, new base, uh, fairly quickly. Right, so this is the log. This is, you have nothing else to do than just, you know, look at those logs. Uh, there's two tabs, two uh, terminal, 
There's one called Start Cache Base, which basically start the Cache Base server. You can see the credential of our very secure uh, local Cache Base server, administrator slash password. Uh, that means Cache Base is running. Uh, and then the other tab, which was installing Just, uh, and then it did a bunch of things with Catch Base Shell, basically create, making sure that our buckets and scope and collection exist in that uh, Catch Base instance. And then this is just Dev, and so you can see it's doing yeah, a whole those bunch nice of things. Yeah, those nice log messages. That's uh, that's Wash there. The yeah, nice the, the nice thing with the messages. emojis. Yeah, we work. At, we spend a lot of time working and, on making sure the emojis are right. And it seems to be happy about it. So, uh, all right, let's go. To One thing out. that's really important there is you see that um, Wash is actually using the Go build tooling, right? So Wash works across different languages. And again, this is, goes to the sort of cross-language point, is that these tools that work with WebAssembly, they don't need to, but if you want to work at a high level, it's important to work across different languages. So Wash makes it easy to build in JavaScript, or uh, to build WebAssembly components in JavaScript, Go, Rust primarily. We have some Python support as well. Um, and basically, we expand that support as, as languages get sort of more advanced on the uh, sort of WASM cloud, uh, WebAssembly sort of landscape, right? As languages implement more features, we make it easy to build uh, WebAssembly components with Wash. Right, so making sure that everything works. Uh, I've opened a new, a new tab on my terminal by clicking on the, on the plus button here, uh, which might look like this on your uh, laptop. Uh, click on plus new terminal and just wrote curl localhost 8080 slash API slash v1 slash underco status. It's sending me a nice message saying success data. Okay, good. So we know that wash works. What about cache base? A couple of things you can do to see if cache base works. Uh, you can use cache base shell or you can just click on the cache base tab. It's going to show you nothing, which means you need to add a local connection. So if you click on the plus, um, it gives you a window to describe the cache based connection and because we do things right uh, it should already be preloaded with this very secure uh, administrator and password uh, it just needs a name so I'm going to call it local I'm going to click on connect and you will see that uh, if everything works well you have the different, bu different buckets that are already available so while you're testing while you're using the API if you want to show that it's actually in cache base, you can just go on the cache base tab and then you know, add the connection and then look into uh, this. Because right now, we don't have anything. Our default bucket is empty. There is a bucket called travel sample. Uh, there's a collection called inventory, and you can see that it has some documents. Uh, boom, 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 boom. There was the scope. This is the collection, collection called landmark, and this is a JSON document. So you should, you should at the end, see something roughly like this. Can you uh, can we access the uh, Couchbase admin UI? Because I, I use that a lot. When right. I can I access it. the Couchbase UI? So when you code. use Gitpod, it's gonna start a new. Blah, blah, blah. It's gonna ask you to open a new tab. Uh, probably, uh, and because I'm configured to not show new tab, uh, it's asking me, do you want to show that tab? So when once you've run Gitpod, it should either have opened a new tab or hide it like it did for me. So I'm going to click on show port uh, 1891. Yes. So importantly, the pod where the Couchbase admin UI runs is 1891, 8091. Um, and there you go. And the username, which you should not use in production, is capital A, administrator. And the password is password. I mean, you could, but you know. This is a workshop. Don't do this. It's not How's because you could that you should. Uh, and Mr. Password, and this is going to show you, this is the, the local uh, cache base uh, UI. We have a managed version that has a different UI, but this is what, you, what you'll see. Uh, this is the overview of your cluster, what it's doing. There's a bunch of metrics. Um, and then if you click on the menu, uh, you can see the list of buckets that exist. <laughs> There's a default bucket that has nothing. There's a travel sample. You can click on documents, and you should be able to see stuff at some point. And there you go. Sorry? OK, so um, this URL, this catch base dashboard, uh, if your browser is configured to just open tabs, it should have opened. If it's not, just like me, there should be 
uh, depending on your browser, something that tells you I have blocked this pop-up window. Uh, and that, that's what I, you, you can see here on my laptop on the on the upper right uh, corner. And it, it, it said it blocked the uh, all those URLs. Um, so that's one way of, of, of getting those. Uh, if you go to ports, there's a tab called ports in Gitpod. And basically that's all the port that Gitpod will um, expose. And you can scroll the list and you can see that 1891, which is the the admin UI of Couchbase is made public, and you should also have a link here. You can copy the URL or you can you can open it. So Couchbase is running, Wash is running. Where do we want to go next? Let me go back to. Ba -da -boom, ba -da -boom. Yeah. Can you open the uh, README in the uh, inside new base there? So. Opening the new base folder. Yes. There is a readme. Right. Closing this down. A um, few. Yeah, towards the bottom, uh, just to start and get a feel for what's already implemented. So you should be able to run through the curls in there. There are sort of a bunch of, at the bottom, there's a bunch of curl commands. There's the API we sort of want and is partially implemented near the top. Right. So uh, this is done automatically by washdev uh, because just dev run washdev. So we have this running, and then that's the curl I, I uh, ran at the beginning. So if you want to run this, you click on terminal, uh, you click on the plus, it's going to open a new terminal, and then you can copy and paste that curl, and this is what you should get. Okay. And one thing I didn't see was the uh, new base should be a, a database in there already. So that should, there, there should be in your CouchDB cluster, there should be a uh, database called new base, uh, and that's where all the data will get stored? Mm, it's default right now. Mm. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to change this. We're going to have to change that probably. Okay, let me let me check actually. Is it going to work? Okay, excellent. Yeah, we've got a script in there. Uh, oh, you, you, I think you curl. You missed the... Did the C not get in there? Maybe not. No, it's just because my... Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's cutting off the text. Yeah, the curl, the curl command and go in. Uh, actually, it doesn't work. No, it's... And I'm assuming that's because we have don't have the right bucket, probably. Hold on. Huh. Welcome to live <laughs> workshops and live code. Wait, uh, someone, um, someone did note that it, it worked. Who, who was that? Okay, created the bucket. Okay, so the bucket's oh, there. So you have to create a bucket. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So... Um, yeah. What's the name of the bucket again? Well, uh, let's just, take just a look. So let's yeah. actually, let's take a look. So if you go into, uh, is it wasn't cloud at uh, You should see a whole bunch of configuration. That's not the right one. Pum, pum, pum. Is it this one? Yes, that's this one. All right. So uh, maybe we go through that config file. Maybe it's a bit early. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you mean this one? Yeah. yeah. Um, so in Wasm Cloud. There's a thing called uh, Wadam. Uh, yes, what is application. WADM for? Yes, application. so it's a uh, application uh, uh, deployment manifest, uh, and you can think of this kind of like similar to some of the Kubernetes, but it works on the scale of just just one Wasm Cloud instance to, to multiple. Uh, and what we're showing there is that we're building the new base component, which is which is there locally, and we're going to uh, sort of set how it can scale, and we're going to connect it to the Couchbase provider. So this gets used when you run wash dev. And so uh, called, that's called a link, right? Yes, yes. So the component and the provider, which sort of gives you the couch-based functionality there, are linked. Uh, and yeah. so what you see here is the connection stream is localhost. A couch base is running on localhost. Uh, the username is administrator. The password is password. Um, and then bucket name is newbase, uh, which is where we failed. So there's a couple ways we can do that. We can either create a bucket called newbase, or we can change this to default. That's up to you. <laughs> yeah, let's, 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 create um, a, let's create a new base. You want to create new base? All right, so to create new Too base, easy. I'm just going to go on to my Couchbase um, extension, and I'm going to click, I'm going to right click on this, and I'm going to do, I'm not going to do it. I thought I could create. Do, 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 do.
huh, I thought I could create buckets from there. So was this uh, YAML file automatically generated, or did we have to build it by hand? Yes. So it's actually a combination. So this uh, file is written by me, but it is used in the process of running wash dev. So wash dev actually pulls in this file and makes changes depending on um, what's configured uh, and uses the file. So it uses a dynamic version of it. Uh, we do this to make it sort of easy to see what is actually involved in the sort of deployment, right? So you've got the component, which was built locally, and there's like a path to a file, and you've got the provider, right? So in running wash dev, you get sort of um, enhanced sort of like functionality around starting, it, that's, that manifest is an override, essentially. Um, all right, I'm gonna create that new base bucket. Yes, <laughs> people who are running in Gitpod, you may need to do this as well. And then I'm gonna rerun the curl, and it should be happier. Yes. Uh, so you do need to create a bucket called new base. How to do this? If you have the cache base interface open, which is what you, I have here, you can click on buckets, then add buckets, I call it new base, and you'll be done. Uh, another way to do it could be to use cache base shell, and I'm gonna use my two hands for that. So you should have a tab called CB shell. Um, and I just typed buckets. Uh, it just give me the list of buckets that exist. I've already created new base, but if you don't have new base, uh, you can type something like buckets create minus H. And it should tell you how to create a cache base bucket. I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna ask you, uh, is anyone having a problem right now? Please raise your hand. Some people, yes. How did you get to CB shell? So uh, how did I get to CB shell? All right. Um, actually, I don't remember. It was opened. Um, what happened? Oh. Uh, that's a new feature that I didn't know about um, from uh, our VS Code extension. If you connect to a local cluster from the VS Code extension, it's gonna open a cache based shell already configured. Uh, the other way to do this is to open a new terminal and just type cbsh with a b, not an n. And it should give you the exact same thing. Yes. Uh, you want to take this? Uh, yeah, that, so see. like a, that's a Couchbase specific. But if you've so if you've done the curl command to insert a document, what you get back is uh, those are Couchbase internals, right? So that uh, partition ID, that, that's a good point. Partition ID is the uh, Couchbase partition for that um, inserted document, right? So the stuff there, like I think CAS also comes through, but like that's kind of like a version essentially. Like you can think of uh, sorry, CAS like compare and set. Um, version there that you can that you can use again from code right they basically made the data uh, because cache base shards documents automatically we have different uh, partition basically a bucket is split into a 1024 virtual partition um, and the way it works is it's not a rest API it's actually a binary protocol and uh, and it's a stateful protocol so when you open a connection to cache base with an SDK what it's gonna do it's gonna call the cache base cluster and from the cluster is gonna get something we call the cluster map. And the cluster map is basically a big JSON file that tells you uh, the partition from one to partition blah, blah, blah are on node one. And the partition from this to there are on node two, et cetera, et cetera. And you get the replicas as well and you, you get all this information. And so you need to have that to maintain a strong consistency. Each time you do an op uh, a key, uh, key value operation with Cashbase, we take the ID, we hash it, and you know that the hash that starts with whatever and ends with whatever goes under partition number blah, 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 
and because we know where the partition blah 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 is because we have the cluster map then we can do it directly which is how we can achieve like sub millisecond um, key value operation most of the time um, all right we have 37 minutes left to go uh, yeah uh, any we'll, more questions oh, before we before we open up the questions if you want to open just the um the golang the golang uh, side so if you open uh, main.go right, so main where is everything going to happen there's a file called main.go yeah and uh, of course I, i'm sure people have seen it by now but inside the new base uh folder there is also a um there's a readme in there which also explains more uh and has some sort of instructions on how to run Again, if you want to, if you're running either locally or, or you've sort of stopped the process inside Git pod, if you run just dev, it'll sort of start the dev process up again. But, um, but yeah, here's the, here's the Go code. So that's where everything is happening. Um, do you want to talk about the import a little bit maybe? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of very generic Go imports that we need. And then there's the binding, um, yes. which is the important part. Right. So... Um, Again, with, with WebAssembly, the idea is that you use the languages and tooling that you are using now, right? And for the most part, things shouldn't have to change. Um, while support for WebAssembly gets merged natively into Big Go and Tiny Go, um, there are some libraries that make things a bit easier to use, right? So normally, you'd only have net HTTP, right? Which is the usual, the usual Go library for, for dealing with um, doing uh, web requests. Uh, and while that's not fully landed in Big Go yet, um, we we have some shims that make it easy easy to use um, sort of web web WebAssembly web handling logic, right? So there are a bunch of comments over there at the imports that sort of sort of explain which which bits and why you need certain parts of this. Uh, another big uh, sort of generated or important import is the component model. Right, so a lot of these rich types of JavaScript, oh sorry, I said JavaScript, but of WebAssembly come from the component model. So that is the sort of layer above the regular sort of numeric operations that WebAssembly core would give you. So the component model adds things like result, right, an optional type, which are pretty, pretty common across languages now, right, um, you know, containers, things like that. Uh, and so we pull in some of that code here just to make it easier to, uh, to, to reference to, to a bunch of those types. Uh, and then the next set of imports is actually generated based on the WIT interface. Oh, actually, could you open the uh, WIT folder? Yeah. So the uh, WebAssembly interface types, WIT, um, helps us define an interface that we can implement ourselves, right? either with components or with, on Wasm Cloud, providers, right? Which are like binaries that sort of speak the same interface, almost like a gRPC binary, you can think of that. Um, and the WIT interface um, basically shows you what the program must implement. And to make that easy to write, right? To make it easy to write a program that implements a WIT interface, um, we generate code. Right, we just like with gRPC, just like with uh, OpenAPI or Swagger, depending on how you use it. Uh, so that's where those imports come from. The document import. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so gonna, you have to write this manually, and then this is going to generate a client, a Wasm client, that can be used based on what's been generated. Yes, yes, uh, and in this so you case, have this been write, written manually. Yes, uh, normally, like let's say for just you know, if you're just a developer at you know. Uh, a company, um, the WIT interface might already exist, right? You, this is kind of work you do once to sort of specify the API you want. And then when you want to write a component that uses this API, you code generate uh, the code that, uh, that comes out of this API, or you essentially pass this file to the code generator, and you get uh, code that you can call, right? Similar to gRPC, similar to uh, OpenAPI, Swagger, et cetera. Right, so this is the insert command. Uh, you can see that it takes uh, dun, 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 where is it? Several options. Uh, most of those options are related to uh, cache base. We come from a cache, so of course there's an expiration. Um, and then if you're going to be strongly consistent, cache base starts in memory, so it's eventually persisted. It, the data enters in RAM, and then if I unplug the computer, you've lost the data, which for important data would be a terrible thing to do. So of course you can change the consistency level you want, which is why you have the Best is two option or the replicate two option. Best is two meaning if it's in RAM, I'm happy. If it's in RAM and written in the disk, I'm happier. And if it's written on disk and then replicated once or twice or thrice, uh, I'm even 
much more happier. Uh, there's a, a global time ad for your operation as we try strategy. There's a whole bunch of functions, uh, of options, sorry, that you can use for each function. Um, and also span because we support open telemetry and tracing. So that's good. Uh, and just to, to sort of uh, bang on this point again, um, this is not network native by default, right? So these boundaries are normally in process. Same binary, function call fast, right? Wasm Cloud, what Wasm Cloud does is actually bring the distributed nature, right? So we add the RPC mechanism that makes this go over the network instead of just in the same binary. Um, that's sort of the value we sort of bring to the table, but this interface is really something I think we haven't had before on a multiple language level, which is a specification, well, I guess other than C, like FFI, right, um, is a language level specification of the types your functions take, right? Even for, again, this works for untyped languages, right, like JavaScript, um, and the contracts that your program fulfills. And what's interesting about this is that if I get a WebAssembly binary and I know it has a certain WID interface, I can actually call those functions directly. Right? I don't actually have to call the rest of the program, I can just call one single function in a WebAssembly binary. But, um, but yeah, in general, that's how this works. Yeah, you remember the right ones run anywhere, uh, kind of promise, that's, that's sort of what enables you to do it with Wasm. It's easier to do with a common interface. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going back to the Go file, um, yes. let's see. So okay. that's the document interface that you've seen, describes several key value operation, there's the common types for all of those operations. Um, and so this is basically a Go program that uses the cache-based SDK as a dependency, and that's going to allow us to implement the interface that we just the interface that we just saw. Yes, uh, yeah. And so the first sort of bit, we've got some URL path, like just like we use a US URL path library for just to make everything really, really simple and easy to understand. Um, the endpoints that are supported, and if you scroll down a little bit, you've got some structs, some basic like. One of the things this demo does is it implements JSON patch, right, which is a, a standard for, make, for performing operations and modifying JSON. Um, and so we've just got a struct to represent a single patch element. Uh, and then some of the some request bodies, right, which are used by, which are used by the requests in there. Uh, how many people in here write Go? If you write Go, like on a regular basis, raise your hand. Okay, so. Some Please people help your neighbors. <laughs> There's, uh, so that was maybe like 10 people, let's say. Um, so you're probably really, really wondering why there isn't a serve mux in here uh, for the people who write Go normally. Uh, and that actually can be added, but isn't in here because TinyGo did not support serve mux is so great. So TinyGo is like, can be a bit questionable. Obviously Big Go is Big Go, so it all works great all the time. Um, but sometimes TinyGo has some rough edges. Um, this is actually fixed with the latest version of TinyGo, and I just haven't updated the, uh, the demo. I thought it was a little close, but um, but yes, you can use a normal surf mux here. Um, you can use gorilla, right? You can use chi or chai. I think it might be chi. I don't know. I don't know I'm, I'm yeah. completely ambiguous <laughs> to, to whatever happened in the Go because yeah. I'm a, I'm a but, uh, but you can use your normal router and uh, and, and be able to. Uh, be able to do um, web with with WebAssembly components. And so you can see it's routing into a different method. Um, this is endless status, which basically is a set of success default success response. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other that are implemented. Uh, which one did we implement? Yes, so uh, everything except for batch upsert is implemented. So there are regular sort of get and set, well, I say get and set, but like let's say, you know, create, uh, read, update, and delete are all the sort of CRUD pattern is all implemented already, so you don't have to do anything for that. But the one unimplemented function is batch upsert. So you have a batch insert and you have upsert, but no batch upsert. So, so that's where the enzyme part shows up. Yes. So right. here, there's the to-do and you know, that's what you gotta, it, that's what we'd like for everyone to try and try and accomplish. Again, you can feel free to borrow liberally from the insert and upsert, or sorry, uh, yeah, insert and upsert uh, methods and functions that are available there. Um, but be basically, it should look just like regular Go, um, you may have to look up a little bit in the bindings, in the generated bindings. So um, the files like .wit.go exist in the, uh, in the repo as well. But, uh, but in general, if you look at the other, the, other, uh, the other endpoints, it should be actually somewhat manageable. 
Hopefully. So you want to go across the uh, upset uh, method, maybe? Yeah. Just sure. to see. Um, so it's a function. It has two parameters, the response writer and the request. Uh, and then it's an upsetting document. So there's a, a document ID parameter as well. So we're going to read the body, uh, send an error if we cannot read the body. Um, I don't know go I need help <laughs> yeah and so so here like we're just gonna you know pull that request body so we've pulled in the request body um, from the incoming uh, request assuming it's JSON yes assuming it's JSON we're gonna unmarshal it and just regular sort of go style and check for errors and keep going and at this point if you look at, at the top we now have one of those uh, upsert structs right we've got a struct that sort of defines or describes an upsert that should happen with the ID and the operations that should be performed yeah, if you go straight to the top. If you do, yeah, there you go. So dark yeah. ID, a JSON patch, yes. objects, and then a map. And just for people who aren't necessarily familiar with Go, on the right side, you've got what the JSON keys will look like when the thing is either, let's say, coming in off the wire or going out. Uh, so either marshalling or unmarshalling right, to, a, to, to JSON. And then we've got, so in there, we've got a doc ID, we've got the patches, and then since it's an upsert, right, we might we might have, like, the, the user might want to insert something, right? So we've got an insert map. Uh, map. And that is a just um, completely generic map instance, right? So you can insert any object you want there. Okay, so yeah, moving back to the code. So one thing I do that's a little bit extra, again, this is just sort of paranoia, you don't have to do this, but I check that the URL that came in, right? So the uh, parameter on the URL and the body of the like the doc ID in the body match, right? This is just optional. I, I just do this for fun, <laughs> just, to make, just to make sure they match. Because obviously, if you're hitting one endpoint with one ID and then using a different doc ID, you might be, like something else might be wrong. Okay, and next, okay, so here we're getting to the WebAssembly stuff. And this is the generated WebAssembly stuff. So the generated code that is imported and named document at the top of the file uh, exports a get function, right? Now, if we go back to the, to the wit, oh yeah, so there's the, there's the get, com, uh, get function. Again, all the code that he's scrolling through right here in the bottom is generated, right? You don't want to go in there and edit that, but you can obviously reference it, and it should be filled out by your um, editor, right? So you said to go back to the wit this definition. Yes. Document. Yep, exactly. So. And so it was a get. Get, yes. There we go. Did I? Oh yeah, yeah, you're on it. Uh, you can also there's um there's wit syntax highlighting, but well, maybe we yeah. saw that another time. Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at the uh, bottom of here, so in document.wit, which is also you know in your uh, in your local repo there, we've got um, the get function similar to insert that was on the slides earlier. Um, you keep scrolling. Yeah, keep scrolling a little bit. There we go. Yeah. So line two forty seven. Um, can, can you highlight that? Yeah. So if you look at that line, um, this, the interface sort of defined here gets turned into and sort of code generated into that Go function, the document.get that you saw from earlier. So again, this is just a mapping of the sort of wit types and sort of the, the sort of IDL, again, very similar to gRPC, similar to OpenAPI, um, to a sort of uh, Go module that works with WebAssembly under the covers, right? So you don't have to really think about WebAssembly here, but you do in that you need to generate the code um, from this description, right? Again, similar to other, to, to other ecosystems, but again, this, is not, this does not require the network. We happen to be using the network, but it does not require it. So yeah, so if you go back to the upsert uh, endpoint, we do a, a pretty, a pretty uh, sort of vanilla or obvious upsert, right? So if the, and only if the get returns that the document is missing, we perform an insert, right? So it can be a little hard to read, but the thing you get back from that operation is a result object. So for those who are not familiar with uh, Rust or some, uh, you could, you could I, I think also like Java's got optional, right, for example, but a result, type is kind of something that either contains the thing you wanted or an error, right? And you have to check, right? So you have to sort of make sure that the operation succeeded 
um, or ch and if there an error happens, you ideally should handle it. So we check if the get worked, and then we do an insert, um, which is, again, just regular upsert things. Uh, and yes, if you scroll down, now, assuming we didn't have to insert the document, right, um, we go doing the update part, right? So we've got the document. Um, we pull it out of the result. So that line where you see get, uh, get res, I think that's line 303, you see get res.ok. That is actually pulling the value, a reference to the value, out of the result and you know, storing it locally so we can use it. So next, um, we're going to go through and apply all the patches to the object we just pulled from either, well, in, in this case, from the, um, from the database. So we ran that get. We got a JSON document out of Couchbase. We've got a bunch of patches that came in on the HTTP request. So we're just going to go through and apply them, right? Not, nothing you know, super crazy here. If you haven't seen uh, the, the patch sort of spec and merge patches and JSON patch before, I, I'd recommend looking into it. I think it's something that a lot of companies sort of rebuild in-house when you, you just don't have to anymore. Again, just on the off chance, uh, it, it's actually pretty interesting. It's a great learning opportunity, but most of our SDKs already have this implemented, and, and we have a subdoc API for the patches as well. So, yeah, yeah, it's just learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so patch the document, replace the existing document, mm -hmm. and then send the um, uh, response. response? Yes, 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 and actually that is a I'm um, just to call that again. So we've, you're, we're using that document module again. So again, that is the auto-generated from the wit Go code. The, uh, the wit describes a replace function, right? And so that's what we're actually calling there. And we're using the generated code module to call replace, and we're using all the sort of like options that it expects, right? Um, I think some of the sort of interesting things here are like, you know, document ID is just obviously a string. Again, that type, that sort of the types module is also auto-generated, right? So we sort of, we, we cast the string that came in over the HTTP request to a document ID, which is a, a wit type, a wit specified type that we've sort of generated. Um, and then we use the, the second argument there to um, create uh, the document raw. So that's like, um, there is a wit type that is a document raw, which is like a, a raw document specified as JSON. Uh, and we've got the patched data there. So that patched data, you can just think of it like a string, right? But we, we do casting, and this, we could have had the interface just take a string, right? Like, this is actually an, an option we chose on this part, but we wanted to make it really explicit, it's right? Ba basically, the difference between a key value store and a document store is that document is, a, is an actual JSON string or structured yes. uh, data. Yeah, it's just like, it's, it's well known. And we make it explicit. It's kind of like, a, you can think of it like a type alias, if you have that in the languages you use. Um, there's, there's not necessarily extra checking here, but just like you should be sure that you're working with the types that the interface says. And a couple options, uh, the cast and the timeout. The timeout, of course, is if your operation, because it's a network operation, things happen with the network. If it's too long, then you can cancel. And the CAS, uh, CAS stands for Compare and Swap. It's used to do uh, optimistic locking. Uh, basically, you have a document. The CAS number is one dash whatever. You retrieve that document. You know the cast number. Let's say there's two people that are doing this at the same time. Those two clients, they all have one dash whatever as a cast value. And so what they're going to do is they're going to upgrade to two dash whatever. That's not how it works. What they're going to do is they're going to replace it with that value. And if on the server the cast value is the same, then everything's fine. And then the server will update the cast value to two dash something because the update went. Uh, well, so the first person that shows up with cas one dash something is going to work. The second person is going to show up with cas one dash something, but on the server side, it's now two dash something. So we're sending an error saying you need to retry because the document has changed. So it's kind of an optimistic locking way of doing things. You have an actual lock that you win doing the database. So that's why we have cas. We have 80 minutes. Do you want to do the live code? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. One thing I do want to note. Um, so if you're running through this, if you run into issues, you can actually file issues on that repo, <laughs> and we'll look at them and we'll uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll get to fixing them. Um, but 
yeah, we're going to go ahead and try to do some live coding here. And, um, well, actually, maybe we'll give you all some time to sort of work on it as we do the live yeah, coding. 17 minutes, yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll live code for about seven minutes here uh, and try and get an implementation working here. And uh, everyone can uh, work on it as well. If you have any questions, please just like raise your hand or get one of, uh, attention from one of us and we'll, we'll sort of walk over and explain it uh, or see, see, see what's wrong, if anything's wrong. Um, and are there any questions? Like just in general, you can be about WebAssembly, some about Go, you know, Couchbase. Uh, if there are any questions, we'd love to take them now. Ah, okay, great question. So uh, it was a question about CAS and whether that's related to the sort of HTTP layer, right? So you have like 300 codes or, you know, essentially different HTTP statuses. Uh, and CAS is just a general sort of database um, concept, right? So, and actually not even just databases, even just at the sort of CPU level, right? So if, you, if two processes are trying to modify the same value, you, what you want to do is be able to do uh, a sort of atomic operation, right, to check if the value, let's say, matches some, some, some quality. Like, usually this is a version number, right? So if you want to change, let's say, a number from one to three, you want to make sure that it's at the version you thought it was before you make the change. So that's just a general database concept uh, and other places, but, but mostly databases. So it's, it's not quite related to the HTTP stuff, but Couchbase, of course, is a proper database, so it will tell you things like the version numbers and CAS and allow you to use them. Uh, and we use it, right, obviously, in the update, just to make sure we don't overwrite an update, right? If two requests try to make the same overwrite at the same time. It's really to avoid locking a document. You know when you lock a document and nobody can do anything else except you? Well, here you do optimistic locking. You hope that there won't be any CAS problem, so you don't lock the document. But you can still lock it if you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, just in general, so you are this, the project, in the project, you are coming in over HTTP. So right, the, the request is coming in over HTTP. Um, in WebAssembly, we are taking the HTTP request turning it into something Couchbase can use, and then talking to the Couchbase provider, right? Which then it talks to a Couchbase database, right? Uh, and the idea is that when you speak the interface, you can actually use other implementations or change around your implementations without the application, which is at the, the sort of component level, the WebAssembly level, having to care or having to, to notice. All right, if there are no other questions, we'll start live coding in, uh, in about, well, what is now five minutes or four minutes, uh, we'll show hopefully a working solution. Hopefully. All right. So oh, question. Yes. Yeah. Multiple uh, questions. In line 132 of yes. the main .go, uh, which is where I think the path for the badge upstart is yes. defined. Line 132. Going, yeah. going, going. I think that's got the wrong path. You go 132. Right here. So when you have documents by ID path. Oh, yeah, measure. you're absolutely right. Hold on. Documents by ID path. Because I think it's matching with the. Oh, no, no. Uh, so upserts can be done by uh, ID. So remember that check that was like checking if the URL was right and the doc ID was right? Uh huh. It's kind of in both places. So, so you can do like. Oh, okay. You're saying this here. I'm saying, I'm saying the upsert by like the. This one. Yeah. So if we go up here, upsert by ID. I'm talking about the batch upsert that we were we, we want to implement. Oh, okay. Sorry, I yeah. thought you were talking about this one. No, this, uh, this the, ba okay. the batch, batch upsert. upsert yes, has the document by ID path, so like it's the Ooh. same we used to get and post. So there are some bugs that are strategically inserted. That's a good find. Uh, this was unintentional, nice but you strategy. found it nonetheless. Well done. <laughs> well done. Well done. So uh, at the very least, you should start by changing this this path right here. Okay, good point. 
Oh, and uh, one thing that you will probably have to do to get this working really easily and really well is maybe a little refactoring, right? So if you know that you're going to do upserts in a batch, it might make sense to factor out all the code for upserting and just make it callable in a loop. So just implicitly, that's uh, sort of the, the, the easy way to, uh, to, get, to get most of the functionality uh, somewhat easily. Oh, uh, there's a second question. Or, OK, we're good. Yeah, raise your hand if you have a question so that I can see you and give you the microphone. Or scream, because I might not be able to see you. So you've copy and pasted the beginning of the batch uh, answer, and now you're replacing the upset operation by the upset batch operation, which expects different options because a different uh, method, and basically expects an array of upset, which is what you had before. And so now you need a loop. And how do you loop in Go? Why write when we can copy? There's a, there's a range in here somewhere. There we go. Yeah. So from the thank you from the handle batch upsert function, which we where we just copied most of the other stuff. Here we go. Right? We basically just need to go through and try and do an upsert for all of these um, operations. So we're going to take this, take this loop here, pull, push it down, and then we know oh, that here So at this point, at this point, we basically want to do everything that was kind of related to a single upsert um, in a list, like in, in a row, right? So we're going to go copy again, and we're going to take the upsert functionality. So if we look up here, and obviously this is a lot to try and just copy into that for loop. So we're going to we're going to go ahead and try and uh, factor it out here. Let's see.
that's just a batch of the magnets. Just mm -hmm. the actual All right, so we need the document in here. Let's say this is. So we can pass in, since what we, since the, the JSON um, patching library we're using here, JSON patch, uses the, um, uses strings, like we can pass in the doc JSON here, we could pass it in as like a, um, let's say an, an interface, right, Inter just the sort of no interface, or we could do like a map or whatever, but let's, let's just do uh, J doc JSON to make it easy. Uh, and you know what, we'll actually just, we won't even return the document ID because we already have that. So we might as well just return an error, right? Uh, if it if it failed or not. Okay. So Yeah, I think, I think so. It's not used because it's not used, I think. And then here, oh, patches that apply. Oh, um, what am I looking for? Oh, it's because this. Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, this is what I need the initial document. Okay. Oh, you need the whole document, not just the string. Yes, I do need the document. Uh, okay, I'm gonna do this.
it's just up the road. Is this the screen? Is it that? Yeah. Yes. See, then we can do. Oh my gosh. Oh no. <laughs> you want me to ask you anything? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Just let me know. It should be in there. Oh, the raw dock. Oh, this is the raw dock. Yeah, this is the raw dock. Um, well, I mean, how to use the gas value well, again? Uh, is it required? Yeah, it'd be nice. Hold on, let me see. I'm wondering why I don't have it here. I think I'm picking the wrong type. I need the, uh, I need to get it. Oh, okay. You know what? You know what? Actually, you could, you could go get, yeah. I'm gonna do it in here. Oh. It's, oh my god, we're out of time. Okay. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to say, All right, we are... Absolutely out of time. <laughs> so uh, it's, even, even with all the copying, it takes a little bit more thinking. Uh, so it wasn't doable in 10 minutes, uh, but hopefully everyone was able to get a little, a little farther and hopefully sort of going through this helped. Uh, but basically, so the, the sort of outline is pretty, is, is, is pretty obvious at least, right? So we just want to, inside the uh, handle batch upsert, we want to go through all the upserts that came in, right? We want to parse the body, pull the body, parse it into an upsert batch for all the upserts, go through and do the upserts, um, do the uh, patches that are specified for each document on, on each given document. We've factored that out to a sort of do upsert function. And here we want batch dot, oops. upserts, right? So we've got the document ID, not the document, and the upserts that should be performed on it. And then we've got, um, basically in this function, we're gonna want to get the doc, which again, we didn't, we didn't get to here, but you can, again, copy sort of the, the get logic that's earlier. We marshal all the patches uh, uh, and we use them. So we apply all the patches to the document and then we want here to make the final sort of JSON document that we want to save, right? The thing we want to use in the actual replace. And then we want to replace the document. Uh, and so that should, be, that should be it. Again, this isn't, this isn't complete, so we can't actually run this. Um, but the, um, the repo it's, it's should... homework. <laughs> yeah, it's homework for the rest of uh, KubeCon, which is wild. But, um, but yeah, this is... So what we really wanted to highlight here uh, is that this is basically just your normal Go code, right? You've got normal Go code, you've got some generated stuff, right? Very similar to gRPC, very similar to OpenAPI. Um, and you get to interact with the interface that, you know, someone, maybe Couchbase, maybe Postgres, maybe, you know, uh, maybe actually someone inside your company has defined for another service. Uh, and then you can call it um, quite natively with code completion. Uh, and if you're a little faster at writing Go, you can finish in 10 minutes. But uh, yeah, that's um, Laurent. Would, would you like to add anything? 
Yeah, just one thing. Well, first of all, thanks for, for joining us for that workshop. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I will be here for the remaining of the day. And uh, also, we're doing an event tonight. Uh, so drinks are on catch base. If you don't know what to do between, uh, what is it, 6 to 8 p.m., uh, please register and uh, please join us at Grace's, which I hear is pretty close to here. Uh, there's a whole program that says AI and apps. I don't really care about that. We're just here to, here to have fun and, and just you know share drinks and, and chat about stuff. Uh, so it would be lovely to see you all there. Uh, and hopefully you can make it. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you, Victor, for doing all the heavy lifting <laughs> and all the work. Yeah. Thanks, Laurent, for you know setting up the dev development environment. Uh, of course, Laurent will be here. I'll also be here. We're, um, I work for Cosmonic. We have a booth that's right outside here. Um, if you have any questions, you know, not about Go, more about WebAssembly. I'm just kidding. We, we also can answer some questions about Go. Uh, please come talk to us. Again, no question is too small. Uh, we love to talk about this stuff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.